Uh, please stand as you are able. I'm reading from John 12, 1 through 8, I think. <laughs> Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Mar Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard and expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Did he not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief? As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Welcome, and um, I'm Chris Bruin. And uh, doing the sermon uh, on daylight savings time, you have to make sure you get your clock set. So I had notes all over the house to make sure that I got the clock set. And when I got home last night, I went and I set the clock. But even then, I still worry that it's not right. <laughs> so this morning at 5 o'clock, I got up and I turned on Channel 6 to their little weather channel, and it's got a clock on it. <laughs> and our clocks were all synced up, so I got here on time. I was supposed to be come an hour early, you know, when it's fall, it's one thing. But if you come an hour late, it's too late. Um, in the, let's just we'll start with a word of prayer. Lord, I just um, just thank you so much that that we can gather here this morning and hear your word, Lord. And uh, I just pray that each of us can take a little part of Mary with us in our hearts. And that, uh, that we can show that extravagant love to others, Lord. And that we can hear that this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The word extravagant is defined as spending too much, is characterized by spending excessively or wastefully, um, beyond what is reasonable, exaggerated, unreasonably high in price, maybe flamboyant, or profusely or exaggeratedly decorated or decorative or showy. And uh, it has the idea of going overboard, of doing too much. And in today's scripture, Mary gave a gift to Jesus that some people thought was too costly. And some people they thought um, that Mary, what Mary did for Jesus was excessive and over the top, just simply too much. And uh, in other words, many thought Mary's gift to Jesus was extravagant. And the word extravagant is thought to be negative, and um, it is used in a bad way many times. And when we see people take the blessings they have been given by the Lord and waste them on themselves, uh, their blessings aren't used to, for good. Um, however, when a person expresses their love and worship for Jesus Christ in an extravagant manner, there is nothing negative about that. And Jesus Christ is worthy of everything we can give him because all we have comes from him anyway. So no gift is excessive, no expression of love is over the top, and no form of worship or love should ever be considered too extravagant to give to Jesus. And in the Gospel this morning, Mary shows us a beautiful example of how we should love others. And I thought about 
how Mary had showed Jesus the most extravagant love possible with grace and humility. Mary took a huge risk in what she did, and I'm sure she knew what would be the backlash from those around her, but she did not let that stop her. And we look a little more into the gospel and just some of the specifics in the reading this morning. And verses 1 and 2, um, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Je Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And here dinner was given in honor, and Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table. Now, to kind of understand this, we go back into um, John 11, where uh, um, Jesus is at Mary and Martha's home because he had been in the area because they had asked him to come because Lazarus was sick. And I kind of realized that uh, um, Jesus only came in, in time that God sent him. And this was all meant so that everything would be put in order for his crucifixion in a few weeks. And so he, um, he did go, but by the time he went to see Mary and Martha, Lazarus had died. And uh, you know, John 11 says, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. And God's Son would be glorified through Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, because the miracle displays the glory of God in Jesus, and it would help initiate the events leading to the cross. So after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, many Jews became believers, and they had faith in Jesus. But then word also got out what Jesus had done. And uh, they, um, you know, I think we do this often in our church. It says, um, the Pharisees heard about it, they called a meeting. That's in John 11, 47. Had a meeting to discuss what they were going to do. And so Jesus knew that his death was coming. And so in John 11, 54, there Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the Jews. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the, near the desert to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. Then it was almost time for the Passover. Jesus went to Bethany. When Passover took place, um, Jerusalem became very crowded because all these people came there to celebrate, celebrate the Passover feast. And um, Bethany was kind of the overflow city for people. So um, here we see Martha is serving, and that's what, uh, that's what Martha does. And it is her home, and she's the hostess. And then Lazarus is reclining at the table, and, and women would not be reclining at the table with the men eating. And then Mary took, in verse 3, she took the pint of nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. And at Christ's day, um, they didn't sit at... Um, sit at a table to eat their meals like we do in chairs. But this is kind of what it looks like with the table. It's low, and then they would sit like one hip on the little cushion and then recline their arm, right, left arm on the table, and eat with their right hand. And so that was how Mary was able to actually do what she did uh, by anointing his feet. And... <clears throat> Um, she would, of course, when a person would come up to the table with someone reclining like that, you'd be much taller than they were. So Mary would have been able to kneel near Jesus in order to anoint his feet with the nard. And the nard is the name of a plant and a fragrant oil that, um, that it comes from and is very expensive. It's from India. And Mary's act of devotion was costly. Uh, it was also an unusual act, 
both because she poured the oil on his feet instead of his head, because that's generally how people were anointed. And she also wiped his feet with her hair. Um, a respectable woman did not unbind her hair in public. And when a Jewish woman married, her hair was pinned up never to come down again. And it showed Mary's humility, for it was a servant's work to attend to the feet. The servants would wash the guests' feet when they arrived at the home after traveling in sandals and on dusty roads. And Mary didn't care what others thought. She didn't care about their gasps, their stares, or their ridicule. Not only has she surrendered her possessions, she has also surrendered her pride. Her primary focus was serving and honoring the Lord. And Susan Hyland writes in her commentary that Mary is loved by Jesus and believes in him. She has seen him raise her brother from the dead. Her outpouring of this elaborate gift is undoubtedly an act of thanksgiving for the gift of life. But John's language indicates that it is much more than, than that as well. The reader has never given any insight into Mary's internal thoughts. Mary's anointing is a prophetic act that is both a sign of Jesus' kingship and its formal announcement. And anointing in ancient times was used uh, for many purposes, uh, for um, kings and prince, priests. Anointing meant the consecration for a specific purpose. Um, the sick were anointed as a ritual of healing, and the dead were anointed for burial. And in theory, Mary's act could have meant any of these things. However, in the trial scenes to come, John will go on to point repeatedly to Jesus' kingship. Mary's actions anticipate and enact the notion that Jesus is king. In this one moment of time, Mary was making a great statement of surrender. By kneeling to him and anointing him, she was declaring her faith in him as the Messiah. She was telling everyone who saw her to do what she did, that her faith was in the Lord Jesus Christ. She at that moment surrendered all to him. And then in verse 4, Judas Iscariot, who was later to be betray him, Jesus, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. And Jesus said, leave her alone. It was intended that she would save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. And Judas is a conflicting character. He is one of Jesus' disciples, and he is about to betray Jesus. Unlike Mary's intentions, Judas' secret motivations are made known to the reader. His concern for the poor is it's merely to cover up his own greed. And Jesus is handed over not by an enemy or a stranger, but by one of his intimate friends. Jesus' response to Judas also allows us to understand Mary's actions. She has anointed Jesus' body for burial. Mary's actions also anticipate Jesus' later teaching to the disciples. Mary wipes Jesus' feet with her hair, the same action Jesus takes in John 13 when he washes the disciples' feet and wipes them with the towel tied around his body. The foot washing is an example the disciples are to follow, something Mary has already done. Mary did what any of the others could have done, but instead of holding back, she took the initiative and honored the Lord Jesus. Here was a woman who loved more than en the Lord more than anything, and as a result, she shows him great love at his feet. She bowed herself before him, and she did not care what anyone else thought. She opened her heart and then opened her hands 
giving all she had in humble worship of the Lord. And this reading from John really goes along uh, well with what I was just thinking about last week. And I was thinking how I needed to start loving those around me better by reaching out to strangers who don't have anyone to love them. And then I, uh, a couple days ago, I remembered the story that I read. And it's, you know, just these God moments that are just so wonderful. And, and uh, there's parts of the basic story that I remember, but there were a couple little things in it that I didn't remember that uh, talked about love. And first, there's, uh, this is a story that was printed in 1995 edition of the Chicken Soup for the Soul, 101 More Stories to Open the Heart and Rekindle the Spirit. And it's titled, Angels Don't Need Legs to Fly. And it's by Stan Dale. And the quote on the first page, when you start to read, uh, says, There is a land of the living and a land of the dead, and the bridge is love. Thornton Wilder. And Stan Daly writes, On one of my recent trips to Warsaw, Poland, the tour guide for our group of 30 citizen diplomats from the Human Awareness Institute in San Mateo, California, was shocked when I said, We wanted to visit with people. No more cathedrals and museums, I said. We want to meet with people. And the guide, whose name was Robert, said, You're pulling my leg. You must not be Americans. Canadians, maybe, not Americans. Americans don't want to visit with people. We watch Dynasty. Kind of dates the probably 1980s. And other American TV shows, Americans are not interested in people. So tell me the truth. You're Canadians or maybe English, yes? Sad to say he was not kidding. He was very serious. However, so were we. After a long discussion about Dynasty and other TV shows and movies, and admitting that, yes, there are many Americans like that, but many more who are not, we were able to convince Robert to take us to visit with people. Robert took us to a convalescent home for elderly women. The oldest woman was over 100 years old, and she was reportedly a former Russian princess. She recited poetry to us in many languages. Although she was not very coherent at times, her grace, charm, and beauty shone through. And she didn't want us to leave, but we had to. Accompanied by doctors, nurses, attendants, and the hospital administrator, we got to hug, laugh with, and hold almost all of the 85 women in the hospital. Some called me Papa and wanted me to hold them. I did, and I cried and cried as I saw the beauty of their souls in their withered bodies. However, the major shock of our tour was the last patient we were to visit. She was the youngest patient at eight, 58 years old. Olga was her name. For the past eight years, Olga had been alone in her room, refusing to get out of bed because she believed, sure, because her beloved husband had died. She no longer wanted to live. The woman, who once was a medical doctor, had attempted suicide eight years earlier by throwing herself under a train. She lost both her legs. As I looked at this decimated woman who had gone through the, the gates of hell because of her losses, I was overcome with such grief and compassion that I fell to my knees and started stroking and kissing the stumps of her legs. It was as, as if I was being compelled by a power much greater than myself. And as I was kissing and stroking her, I was speaking to her in English. I only found out later that she did indeed understand me. But that was irrelevant because I hardly remembered what I said. It was something about feeling her pain and her loss and encouraging her to use her experiences to help her patients in the future with greater compassion and empathy than ever before. And that in this time of great transition, her country needed her more, her now more than ever. Just as her country was ravaged and decimated and was now coming back to life, so must she. And I told her that she reminded me of a wounded angel, and that the Greek word angel, angelos, means messenger of love, servant of God. 
And I also reminded her that angels don't need legs to fly. After 15 minutes or so, everyone in the room started sobbing. As I looked up, Olga was glowing as she called for a wheelchair and started to get out of bed for the first time in eight years. Mary was a messenger of love, servant of God for Jesus. Go now and be a messenger of love, servant of God, and give extravagant love away to all those you meet. Let us pray. Lord, we just, uh, oh, we just thank you for the love that you show us. And we just ask that, that we may be able to show extravagant love to those around us, Lord. And, and uh, you've given us such a wonderful example in Mary. And, and we know how to love, Lord, and we just need to do it. And we just lift all this up to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.